Now, uh, one could, of course, talk about many different things in Dietrich von Hildebrand that relate to personalism. What I am going to talk about is the heart. Of course, not the heart in the sense in which the cardiologist uh, examines it, but in a different sense. I hope it will become clear what sense I'm going to talk it about. Now, it was a long, long, long time ago, during my teenage years, in Salzburg, Austria. Let me repeat, the town which has the distinction of being Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's birthplace. <laughs> The family was sitting around the dining room table for what we call Mittagessen. Given the time of the day, you would call it lunch. But in Austria, it's the big meal of the day. And I started carrying on about, uh, about what I had just heard in a course at the teacher's training school I attended. I wanted to demonstrate my sophistication. And so I repeated, maybe parroted, would be a better word, what our philosophy education professor had told us about feelings. That professor was immensely popular with our students because we felt that he was really and truly with it, that he was always in tune with the latest fashions. Now, I do have little recollection of what I said, except that I downgraded all feelings to just feelings and considered them in line with my popular teacher all as belonging to the same group as being examples of precisely the same type of objects. Whether it's being jolly or being angry or gratitude or jealousy or love or depression or euphoria, just feelings, nothing more and nothing compared with the intellect and the will. Now, my father was listening to my speech, not saying anything that was prudent for how does a teenager react when contradicted. <laughs> Some days later, he handed me a typescript, several pages stapled together, and said something like the following. In view, of the, <clears throat> in view of the interesting things you said about feelings the other day, you probably would like to read this. Now, hardly anyone in this room probably remembers the ancient typewriters and the carbon copies one made with them. But that's the kind of copy I had in my hand. And giving the somewhat much shape of the letters, it must have been something like copy seven or eight. The typescript was about ten pages. It was by a certain Dietrich von Hildebrand, someone I have never heard about. It was entitled Die Geistigen Formen der Affektivität the spiritual forms of affectivity. Now, since even at that point, my father had said absolutely nothing that sounded even only remotely critical of the manner in which I had carried on a couple of days earlier, I actually read those pages. And then I read them again and again and again, what I experienced reading them, I can explain only in words I have heard others use when describing their first encounter with von Hildebrand's thinking. It was for my mind 
like a cataract operation is for one's eyes. Suddenly, I realized that what counts is not joining words together so that they form a meaningful sequence and sound impressive. Avant-garde, different from what common folks believe. Forward-looking, progressive, etc., etc., etc. What counts is that one actually sees, understands the objects that exist independently of one's mind. Now remember, philosophers don't use the word objects in a negative sense, but they call everything that exists and will be thought of an object. Okay? So, uh, the object, so, so one must actually see and understand the objects that exist independently of one's mind and one must reasonably accurately represent what they are by one's words. It is not even enough for one's statements to be consistent. Important as consistency is, of course, but one could very well be consistently <coughs> mistaken. It's a good possibility. What counts is paying close attention to what is really there. Dietrich von Hildebrandt's modest words, written on even more modest pieces of paper, made the eyes of my mind see just how wrong I had been about feelings. Now, paying close attention to what is really there, that's where phenomenological realism comes into the picture. Start out with an examination of what is immediately given. Thus, reading the spiritual forms of activity began shaping me into a phenomenological realist. Sounds much more complicated than it really is. Start out with investigating what is immediately given. Now, what in particular did that essay teach me? First, I realized that one of the reasons for being disastrously misled is the presence of equivocal terms in language. Terms used to designate a variety of objects that are similar in some respects, but often only superficially so, because of being fundamentally different from each other. Those equivocal terms conceal the difference and make us consider very different entities, as if they were all of one kind. Now, one of those dangerous terms is feelings, in German, Gefühle. Von Hildebrand pointed out that the word is used for at least three different types of entities. The first he termed bodily feelings, the second psychic feelings, and the third effective responses. Now, psychic, of course, has nothing to do with extrasensory perception or someone consulting a medium. <laughs> in that concept. No, Yuri Geller, he can stay away. Yuri Geller doesn't need to apply, uh, but it means pertaining to the soul. Now, so what are those three entities, according to von Hildebrandt? Bodily feelings are experiences like a headache, the pleasure of taking a warm bath. Oh, that's one of his favorite examples. Yeah? or being tired. They are conscious states which characteristically involve an awareness of one's body. They are experienced either as being localized in a part of one's body, such as a headache, a toothache, or a bellyache, or as pervading one's entire body, being tired, or the pleasure of taking a warm bath. So that affects your entire body. Okay? The experience 
of one's body connected with them makes them different from psychic feelings, such as a bad mood or a state of depression, a state of euphoria, or the jolliness accompanying being tipsy. I said state of depression or euphoria. This expression is important, state. Those feelings are states of one's consciousness rather than responses of one's mind. In experiencing them, the human consciousness remains, as it were, within itself. All of those states must, of course, have causes. But in many cases, it is possible to experience a psychic state without even having any idea of what caused it. Here's an example. Suppose a man wakes up one morning totally blue, depressed. For those of you who don't know <laughs> that meaning, uh, of th that use of the word blue. Okay? Okay, so he wakes up totally blue. During the day, the feeling gets worse. It remains present for the next several days. And in the end, he makes an appointment with the shrink. The psychiatrist, shrink, by the way, it's a psychiatrist for those, <laughs> <laughs> for, for those among you. <laughs> okay, so he makes a, an appointment with a shrink. And the psychiatrist begins with asking what medication the blue man is on. And he starts listing them, and at one point the shrink explains, hold it right there. Did you say, phacomacrodemium? Yes, the blue man answered. And the psychiatrist says, likely that's the culprit. Severe depression is one of the many possible side effects of that drug. Ask your physician to, pre to prescribe phergomicrodamium instead. That might be better for you. Now, th this example makes clear that although each and every psychic state must, state must have a cause, there is no meaningful or intelligible relationship between the experience and what brings it, brings it about. This can go so far, as in the example I just gave, that at first one doesn't even know what the experience's cause is. Now, this last point shows that psychic states are separated by a veritable abyss from what von Hillebrand calls effective responses. Now, phenomenological realists are supposed to be show and tell characters, show and tell, yeah, to the extent to which you can do that in philosophy. So let me once again use an example. Think of a person who is overjoyed about the promotion at work and compare that to the state of euphoria of the formerly blue man which he experiences after having been on phergomicrodamium, the replacement drug, for a couple of days. The formerly blue and now euphoric man does not have to recognize anything, gain knowledge of anything to experience his state of euphoria. The other man the one with the promotion had to recognize that he was promoted. Otherwise, his joy would be impossible. The formerly blue person's euphoria is a reaction to the new drug. The other person's joy is a response to his having been promoted. In that joy, in experiencing that joy, the person is like in the act of recognition preceding it and making it possible, consciously directed to the fact of having been promoted. 
This fact is the object of the joy. The joy is a response to this object. Now, phenomenological realists use in this context the word intentional, by which they don't mean on purpose, but object directed. A little bit misleading term, but I can't. It's used by phenomenological realists, and I can't do anything about it. I think it goes back to as far as Brentano that they use it. So object directed, object directed. Moreover, there is an intelligible, understandable, understandable, clearly understandable relationship between the joy and the event that gives rise to it. Everyone this, in this room can relate to and can understand that a promotion gives rise to joy. In contrast, that phago microdamium causes euphoria and phago macrodamium causes depression are brute facts. There is no intelligible relationship between those drugs and the psychic states they bring about. By the way, this applies also to alcohol and the jolliness it causes. But in this case, through, through many experiences which are the basis of an inductive generalization, we have become used to that causal relationship. But in principle, oh, why is it like that? It's not intelligible. It's not an intelligible relationship. So, psychic states, psychic feelings, are not intentional, remember that's object directed, and an intelligible relationship between them and what brings them about is lacking. Effective responses are intentional, object directed, and there is an intelligible and meaningful relationship between them and what brings them about or motivates them, their object. Now, here are the examples of effective responses. Grief over the death of a loved one. Gratitude. Compassion. Hatred. And love. All of them are responses to an object. Effective responses to an object. Now, those were some of the matters I began to understand about feelings from reading the typescript my father had given me. Now, it motivated me to look also at other parts of von Hillebrand's work. One of the publications I turned to was his book on ethics. Plato is prominently mentioned in that book, so I started reading him also. A short time after I'd immersed myself in this reading material, I actually met von Hildebrand. He had retired from his teaching post at Fordham University and frequently visited Europe, including Salzburg. During one of those visits, he gave a presentation in a private home to which I was invited. Guess what the topic was? The spiritual forms of affectivity. Now, those who knew him personally, personally know that he was a forceful speaker, which is an understatement. And I felt truly privileged to be able to listen to him. His words confirmed and clarified what I had read. I'm skipping a little bit uh, and jump down there. Uh, 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 we are talking about effective responses now. Remember, they are different from the bodily feelings and the psychic feelings. Don't confuse. Don't do what I did <laughs> before I looked at uh, von Hillebrand's article. Confuse them with each other. Okay? They are totally different from each other. Now, effective responses share an important feature with responses of the will and with decisions to act. Let me use two examples of such decisions and then compare them with effective responses. First, suppose a young man sees an elderly lady desperately in need of help. He decides 
to assist her. Second, another man notices an elderly lady in the same situation. He could easily come to her aid, but he thinks, I do not want to get involved. And he decides to go out of the way of the situation as far as possible. Compare how those two decisions relate to their object, the plight of the elderly lady. Obviously, the first corresponds or uh, conforms to what the object calls for. The second, contra the second contradicts to what the object calls for. Now, similar correspondences and discrepancies can be seen in the case of effective responses. Here's an example. Suppose two outstanding violin players are informed that their colleague, a little bit more capable than each of them, suffered an injury to his hand which will keep him from playing the violin ever again. The first player responds with sorrow about the event and with compassion for the injured colleague. The second, while pretending to be sad about what he has learned, responds with being pleased to no end, thinking, serves him right, he will never again beat me in a violin competition. Now, quite obviously, his response is contrary to what the object responded to calls for. In contrast, the compassionate person's response conforms to what the object demands for. Demands. Do you see the similarity between the decisions of the will in the previous example and the effective responses? Uh, the two examples of effective responses. So this shows that similar as with decisions of the will, there can be a conformity between the content of an effective response and the, objective resp and the object responded to. There can be a conformity between the effective response and the object responded to. There can also be a discrepancy between the content of an effective response and the object responded to. Now, a conformity or correspondence is present in the case of responses of compassion with earthquake victims, gratitude for a precious gift, admiration of a person's heroism, indignation about an act of brutality, repentance of a wrong one has done, or one of Dietrich von Hildebrand's favorite examples, joy over the conversion of a sinner. In those cases, there's a correspondence between the effective response and the object responded to. A discrepancy is present in envy, resentment, taking pleasure in another, in another person's misfortune or hatred. Now, the recognition that there can be a conformity or a discrepancy between an effective response and its object presented me with an entirely new dimension of the question, what is wrong with me? There is, of course, prior to that new dimension, the enormous discrepancy between my reason and my will. How often does it happen that my reason clearly tells me such and such is the right thing to do, and I do the opposite? How often does it happen that my reason clearly tells me such and such is the wrong thing to do, and I do it anyway. Now, but when considering the center within myself from which my effective responses arise, my heart, 
an enormous discrepancy between my reason and that center becomes obvious. A, lock, a lack of conformity that might even relegate the reason-will discrepancy to something comparatively minor, disastrous as it is in itself. Now here I have two examples, a longer one which I skip and a shorter one. <laughs> Yeah, I have to skip the longer example, even though it may, may be the better one, I don't know. Yeah. Now, but here's the shorter example. Think of one of your skills you are especially proud of. Huh? Every one of you probably has a particular skill they are especially proud of, whatever it may be, whatever it may be. Now you meet someone who is much better than you with respect to that same skill. How will your heart react? The way it is appropriate, with appreciation of the other, with admiration for his even greater skills, and with gratitude that you were allowed to meet him and to witness his performance? Or might it not rather be envy and jealousy, dislike, maybe even hatred? And uh, is, that, is that not a typical example? Maybe you tell me now, oh, yeah, Fritz, speak about yourself. <laughs> Okay, I'm speaking about myself. But if you exempt yourself from what I just said, do you know what I'm going to tell you? Get a grip. <laughs> so, Adolf, is that example not typical? Does it not show that the connection between our heart and what reason presents to us is out of whack, is not the reaction of our hearts, often like a slap in the face of reality. Now, recognizing the formidable discrepancies between our heart and the responses actually demanded by the objects around us might help us to see a huge second area of work required of us uh, if we want to become better persons. The first area concerns, of course, our will. I must get myself to make the decisions demanded of me to carry out those actions which are obligatory and omit those actions which are contrary to my duty and hopefully also in some cases beyond, go beyond the call of duty, make decisions that go beyond the call of duty, even though omitting them would not be morally evil if they really go beyond the call of duty. But the second is making the responses of my heart correspond to what the objects of my consciousness demand of me. To become compassionate, grateful, someone responding with sadness when sadness is called for, most of all to become charitable. Well, I hear someone say, you are speaking about feeling, oh, excuse me, effective responses. But unlike the decisions of the will, which are the basis of actions, those effective responses are not free. They well up within you spontaneously. So good luck, Fritz, with the second area of trying to become a better person. It is a waste of energy. Focus on your will. That's enough work. Now this, this objection points, of course, at an important feature of effective responses. So it's always a good idea if you, uh, if you want to uh, speak against something, to point out, uh, okay, what's the kernel of truth in it? And the kernel of truth in it is, uh, effective responses are not under the direct control of our freedom. 
Now, I said, of course, direct, okay? Direct, important verb. Unlike the decisions of the will, which are the basis of actions, okay? Uh, I cannot bring about compassion, love, enthusiasm, or admiration simply through free decisions. If inappropriate effective responses are present in me, such as malicious pleasure, disappointment over something I should feel positive about, or intense dislike of someone else, I cannot make those effective responses go away simply by yelling at them, be gone. This does not mean, however, that my freedom is totally powerless with regard to those responses. My heart, while not directly accessible to my free decisions, is un indirectly under its influence. With regard to changing the human heart, a long, slow, involved process lasting a lifetime. The first step is to occur even prior to making any free decisions concerning effective responses. It consists in trying to recognize as clearly as possible how deficient my heart is, how many inappropriate responses dwell in it, and how cold and indifferent it often is when it should respond with intensity. But second, there is what von Hildebrand calls cooperative freedom. While I cannot simply turn off inappropriate effective responses, I can use my will to say a conscious, deliberate no to them. Now that doesn't make them disappear. disappear. But it takes away at least some of their venom. It, von Hildebrandt uses the expression that, that deliberately saying no to them with my will decapitates them. That may be an exaggeration, that's his term, but that may be an exaggeration because that sounds almost like it kills them. But it doesn't kill them. Okay? It doesn't kill them. But it takes at least away a little bit of their venom, as I would say. Conversely, if there are appropriate responses of the heart, I can use my will to say an explicit yes to them, to sanction them, as von Hildebrandt calls it, which means that my personality comes to stand explicitly behind them, causing them to be more than mere chance events. Events. My sanctioning them in this manner makes them more explicitly mine than they would otherwise be. Now it seems that if a person consistently uses his or her will in this way, this will lead eventually to a condition in which the inappropriate responses will no longer or at least to a lesser degree spontaneously arise and the appropriate ones will more readily appear. So that would be the indirect influence of our will on our heart. Complicated, but demanded of us, demanded of us. Now, the previous comments moved the presentation from a phenomenological investigation of effective responses in the direction of a counselor's advice. Permit me to add one more suggestion along those lines. Do you feel that your loving, compassionate, charitable side is deficient? Probably all of us will have to say yes. Yeah. Again, speak for myself. Yeah, sure. But <laughs> remember what I said before. Okay? Now keep, uh, if you feel that, if you feel that your loving, compassionate, charitable side is deficient, keep asking yourself, how would a loving, 
compassionate, charitable person act in such and such a situation, in situations in which I often find myself. Now, that's not difficult to recognize. It's <laughs> quite easy to recognize. Now, then decide to act in that manner. Actions are, after all, under the direct control of your will. Simply act like a loving, compassionate, charitable person would act. If you do this over a prolonged period of time, then maybe, just maybe, your heart will slowly limp after your will and love, compassion, and charity actually might begin dwelling in you. <laughs>